Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox, and welcome to another episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Our guest today is Diane Klutz. Now, Diane was an Army nurse in Vietnam. She is a retired assistant professor of nursing from Texas A&M University. These days, Diane would describe herself as an author, writer, and speaker. Diane's debut story, Round Eyes, An American Nurse in Vietnam, was published in 2012, and a new illustrated edition was published this year in 2019. Diane has also authored You Can't Sleep Here, which is a partially factual but mostly fictional story based on her research dissertation, which was her work as a nurse practitioner to female inmates in a Texas county jail, along with volunteer services within the homeless community. And this whole story then enhances the credibility of this story. And we're going to let Diane talk about this and also her background as a nurse in Vietnam and why she made that decision. It is a pleasure to welcome Diane Klutz to the Success Insight Podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Howard. Thank you for having me. So, Diane, I have to ask you this question, and we're more certainly going to uh, get into the books, but how does a 20-something-year-old okay. young lady decide she's going to up and become a nurse and go to Vietnam? Well, number one, I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania, and the only options really, well, I decided to become a nurse, went to nursing school, and at that time it was in a hospital thing, but I wanted to venture. I wanted to get out of the small town, and I knew my parents were not happy with the idea of me going off by myself to some city, so my junior year, I joined the Army, and my folks were okay with that. So I joined the Army Nurse Corps as a private, and then upon graduation, I was commissioned, and then the rest is history. But I have to say that I think it was a long history of my family being in the military. My dad was a medic, World War II, and two of my brothers were in the Army, and so it just seemed that's what I wanted to do, and that's how I did that. So going into the Army, had you had, I mean, you had your dad and his experience being a medic, which is actually fairly close in some ways to your experience. I would imagine, you know, I know you'll correct me, and what were, and your brothers were in the Army. Did they in any way, did they say like, Diane, this is a great, great idea. You're going to love it, or this is going <laughs> to this is gonna do this for you or that for you? Or did they say, Diane, are you crazy? I, you know, to be honest... I don't remember my brothers. I think my oldest brother, Gene, who I spent more time in Vietnam with, he probably said, you're kind of crazy to be doing this. But then on the other hand, I think my whole family always pretty much said, well, you're going to do what you want to do. So, of course, I was under, gee, I was under 18, I think, when I joined. So my parents had to sign for me to, you know, to allow me to even join as a non-commissioned before. But no, I think they were all supportive. My oldest cousin, or my oldest cousin, she was an Air Force nurse back, oh, gee, that would have been in the 50s. And so the family was pretty much supportive of me going, even though knowing that Vietnam was there and there was that chance that I'd be going. Yeah, so you had a good family history of military service. And as a nurse, you went to Vietnam, and I'm sure there's no way to summarize this in a sentence or two within the constraints of a 30-minute interview. But this book that you authored, Round Eyes, An American Nurse in Vietnam, and again, for our listeners, there's a second edition, which is illustrated. So I'm really excited to hear more about that. But how did your experience from Vietnam as in the nurse corps kind of shape who you became? came once you came out of that service? Well, I have to say, as you mentioned earlier, I was, I was naive. I was, and I think most of us at, at that period, of course, the Vietnam War had been going on for a while, and I watched it on the news. That was the first war that really came into the living room, really, nightly, with the number of killed, who, and everything else. That was a big deal to get to the television at 
five o'clock and see how many dead that day, unfortunately. But changing wise, I mean, I went there with the idea of Florence Nightingale going to the Crimea. I was going to help our poor soldiers. But not only that, I was I was there to support them in freeing a people from the claws of communism. I was there to help right an injustice to the Vietnamese people. And so I was very, I'd say, full of myself, full of self-righteousness and that sort of thing. And I think how it changed me was actually my first night in country coming from the airplane during the night and when we arrived. And in a bus, they took us through a village to get to Benoit, where our incoming processing took place. And seeing the people there, my eyes, I mean, there was machine guns, there was this, but I, I looked at the South Vietnamese and it just struck me. And then, of course, Later, I found out that they didn't really care who was over them. They thought of us as actually impeding, I think, a lot of their ways because their country was ripped apart, torn apart. They had no food. There was no shelter really for them, and they didn't care. They, they just needed the basics in life, and I felt deceived. And then I was angry at myself that, that I actually accepted this rationale for us being there. I bought into it all. So I think it was a learning thing for me. I grew up a lot. I can imagine that. I have to imagine as well that that's a hard realization when you get the rhetoric around what you're doing, but then when reality sets in of what is actually happening, that can be a little bit nerve-wracking. This, uh, there's a word in there. Of quite, I don't betray. Betrayed. There's I a good word. Betrayed. There's a good word. I, I felt betrayed, and I felt I felt betrayed because my little brother had been there a year. I did get to see him there, so that was good. But and then my, I, I just had a friend killed there, or a neighbor from high school. Mm-hmm. Betrayed probably is the best. Okay. Well, tell us more about your book, Round Eyes, an American Nurse in Vietnam. What are some of the takeaways that not only our listeners, but individuals who are going to perhaps be interested in reading the book and, and we'll provide links back to the book on Amazon. But what, tell us more about the book, why you wrote it, how it's structured and who's it for? Well, I originally wrote the book for, well, it was a catharsis of sorts. I wanted to clear my head. It it had been 40-some, well, at least years. And I didn't have awful flashbacks, but I wanted to just write it down. And my uncle encouraged me. He was a captain in the Navy, and so he had several books. And he said, Diane, it would really be a good book. There's not too much out there about nursing in Vietnam and that. As I was writing it, I realized that what I was writing was like more cynical more it, it wasn't a blood and guts it didn't talk about some of these legs or fingers or some of the awful things that was going around but I took it from the stupid some of the stupid things and some of the funny things too but you know I felt that some of the things they asked us to do were just what can I say stupid for example I had been in country I think this is January and I think there was a general of some sort. I didn't know who he was, but he was up in Da Nang, which is not far. I was stationed in Quignon, which is on the coast. And so the general must have said one night at mess, which is the dinner, evening dinner, that, gee, he sure missed seeing American girls, you know, or, or something along that line. Well, lo and behold, not too much longer after that, his aide sent a thing down telling several of the hospitals in that area that they were to send nurses no. to have dinner You're with kidding. the general. Oh, my gosh. No, no. And in the book, there is a picture. It's very hard to see, but there is a picture of the three sent from my my roommate, myself, one of the other gals who came in country with us. There's a picture of us beside this car. And it's printed, there's a sign on the car that says, the general's girls. And then we're there with our escorts. And and so we had to, well, 
okay. So at that time, my brother, my oldest brother, who I hadn't seen, he'd been in Germany and I was here and he was coming in country for his year and he was going to be coming soon. And so I told the colonel when he called us in, I said, sir, I would like to decline. Please send somebody else. And he said, no, you are going. And I explained. And then finally he said, well, have you heard the word court martial? And I said, I was rather taken aback by that. And I said, well, for declining to go to a party when, and this is going to be right before Tet. So we were getting ready for the annual Tet offensive. So anyway, on that note, we were sent out. I was to go and we had to find dresses and hose and get together outfits so that we would look presentable to be with the general. All to stroke this this general's ego. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just, you know, it was just stupid things like that. Okay. So what other stories can be found in the book? I mean, is, is it just structured as anecdotes or there's, there's, I could certainly understand the cynicism as you've just described in this past story. Yes. Well, I think there's, there's a section on some of the funny things, even before I have a, a brief section of it before going to Vietnam. And so basic training and some of the things there. And anyway, there's some other history there. I don't know if you're, if you remember that uh, in Forrest Gump, I think we talked about this before, the reflecting pool. Right. Where, or, you know, in front of the thing. And well, that actually did happen. And my roommate and I were sitting on the edge of that when accidentally we were sitting there when the bullhorn started and protest marches. And so the National Guard came up around us. So this is in D.C. This is before we went. So, right. Yeah, you know, just brief things like that. But I would like to read. There is something here okay. that I would like to share. Sure. And number one. I want to remember the patients, the guys that, and women. I mean, I took care of, we took care of civilians also that were caught in the crossfire and sometimes captured Viet Cong too. But patients were just, the American soldiers were absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to read this part. They were respectful, extremely appreciative of the nurses who cared for them. Even though they were only at the hospital for a short time, Bonds were often formed. The nurses listened as as soldiers shared about their families, loved ones, and home. They shared their pictures. Sometimes the nurse would write a letter home for the soldier if he requested, and sometimes the soldier asked the nurse to read a letter from home. But the one thing these soldiers didn't share was their war experiences, and we nurses didn't ask. It wasn't from a lack of caring or even a lack of interest on the nurse's part. It was more like hearing it would bring the war into the sanctity of the hospital. The hospital was the one place that was as close to the real world as we would get. The ugliness of war was forgotten amidst the work of nursing, and the soldiers had a brief respite from the killing of war or seeing friends killed. And so during the 12 hours of work, for the few days as a patient, the nurses and soldiers could pretend that the war was somewhere other than where they were. And I think that, that to me, was meaningful, of course. <laughs> what can I say? Sure. Coming back to the States after your service in Vietnam and you went on to get your master's and advanced degrees within nursing. So tell us more about life after Vietnam and, and, and assistant professor of nursing at Texas A&M and what prompted you to want to continue to really go into being an educator as well as being a, a nurse practitioner? Well, I mean, I got out, I, I, I met my husband, my actual maiden name was Mumper and we got married. He had been in Vietnam. And that's how we met with back in uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. And and so we got married, and for a brief time, he got out of the service and was back at school in Arlington, Texas. Uh, but for a brief time, I was in, and I was a mumper klutz. So that's a part of a whole new story. <laughs> but I, I, when I went into the service, I had my, it's not even an associate's degree. Back then, we had diploma programs. And so I knew I always wanted to get my bachelor's. So it took me about 20 years after I graduated. So it was 1989. I finally struggled through and received my bachelor's. And after that, as my husband said, it was just school, school, school. So I, so I went on in and got my master's and then my nurse practitioner. 
And it was in the early, I'd say, 2000, something like that, that one of my former students said, you really need to get your doctorate. And so that's when I started working on my doctorate degree in nursing. And I loved, I mean, I loved that whole part of it. But after that, my husband said, that's it. No more, you know, and, and my goal was to get it before I was 60. And I did. I think I was 59. And Excellent. I finished it. Excellent. So we can call you Dr. Klutz. <laughs> yeah, that's a scary thing right there. <laughs> I'm not sure which is worse, that or nurse Klutz. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm curious. Tell us about the going on for the doctorate, because I know I, I have a friend here in Chicago and his wife. She didn't serve in the military, but she had the bachelor's, uh-huh. got her nurse practitioner and went on to get her uh, PhD in, in nursing. And so tell us a little bit more, because this actually gets into your second book, which is You Can't Sleep Here. And this was based on your dissertation research. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I've always, I think as a nurse practitioner, my first job actually was providing HIV care, education. And one of those places took me to the Denton County Jail. And so I would do testing and stuff and take care of patients who were HIV positive at that point. But then it moved me on later into into providing women's care at the jail as a nurse practitioner. And at the same time, I was teaching up at Midwestern State University, which is in Wichita Falls. And I got involved there with in a homeless shelter and set up a clinic type thing and worked with a lot of patients, saw a lot of people there and brought my students in with me on that. And at the same time, I was still living in Denton, so volunteered at a soup kitchen. Mm-hmm. So I think through all of that, and then it just, I just started realizing that there was a whole population and mostly it was women who have never really been studied, especially in rural areas. And at this time, I think I started all of my research and things in 2005, but then it was in 2007 that I actually had permission to interview ladies with children. And that's, and I think the thing about it and why I wrote the book was that the ladies volunteered. I had six ladies volunteer to be an in-depth interview, which took about two hours. So, it, and it was quite hard during that time because there'd be little children crying. So we interrupt and do things like that. But after their interviews, and most of the time I was crying, they were crying, but, um, but I said, what can I do for you? You know, what, how can we, how can I help? How, what do we do? Each one said, just make sure people know our story, you know? And, and I think that was always in the back of my mind even though I published a dissertation about it, put all their stuff in, that doesn't get very far. And I met with some resistance in the local community because some of the findings weren't very positive, I I have to say. And so I decided after I wrote my first book that the next one I had to tackle was the book. And I called it, my original title was Someone to Hear Us, because that's what they said time again, we just want someone to hear us. But there was one particular lady who had three small children and she just wanted them to take a nap. And this is over a hundred degrees in Texas in the summer right. or Texas. And it was brutal. And she kept going place to place. Mostly they would gather, well, in the book, it's wall market, but, but she would go there and she was, turned away each time that she would go to find a place in the store because it was the only place with air conditioning. And I just tugged at my heart that she was just told, you can't sleep here, you know, and she was turned away. And that's you know, what I did. Diane, there's, there was an article in our local paper, maybe it was, or it could have been on, uh, on LinkedIn or Facebook, but how mm-hmm. in the today, 2019, with the, the mm-hmm. homeless population and also the continuous budget cuts, that we have the, the public libraries. And yes. I had had a guest last week who actually spoke how tax reform back in California, the proposition, I think it was Proposition 13, 
They cut the property mm-hmm. taxes. Property taxes then resulted in libraries essentially getting dis- de-staffed, downsized, closed. And the resurgence in today of the libraries is their ability to reinvent themselves. And so this that was from Dan Gueria, who we interviewed last week. Mm-hmm. And then this week in this article, it spoke about how the libraries have become kind of the de facto hangout for individuals who are the folks that you've just described, you know, that they're yeah. it's hot outside. We've got to find a place where we can just sit, relax. You know, I would never say, can't say relax because they're certainly not relaxing, yeah. but a place yeah. that can come and be safe and to get some respite from the heat. And there's, there's the libraries. And it's just, so as you were sharing that being turned away at Walmart, well, where else do you go there? You know, in, you know, hundred degree heat in Denton, Texas, that's kind of hard. It is. And, and, you know, with an infant and a toddler and a five-year-old, they do need naps. And unfortunately, you know, and it's just the rules of some of the shelters, you know, the Salvation Army and that, they have to have their rules because they were made for men. Right. Most of the stuff out there was built kind of around men. and But it didn't matter at eight in the morning. Everybody had to leave. Right. And you couldn't come back until five at night. Mm-hmm. And so... Where do you go with your children with this, with yourself? And yes, and it still is. And and I have heard from a friend of mine without a home because she lost a job and lost this. So she was living in her car. And I said, well, what do you do during the day? And she said, well, I go here and then I usually go to the library. And she's back east. But she said, I go to the library. And then, and then to that, there's you know places that I can get food for supper. And then I go back to my car at night. And yeah, and you're right. Perhaps, I don't know, it's not lost that the issues of homelessness and having places to go, it's it has not changed. I mean, you, can, you do the research, no. you get your PhD, study the issue. And then you would like to think as a result of this research, something has changed, something that's changed for the better. But in some cases, I'm curious, are the issues still there? Have they, have they changed in any way that you can see? Because you have got a unique lens in which to look at this topic. <laughs> I think doing a qualitative, which is what I did research, you have to go back from what you see, then you have to go back in history to see the change. Is there an improvement? It, what has changed? And in reality, in the 20 years that previous, when there was the, let me just say, nothing has improved. Nothing has changed. Even with, you know, there was a lot of talk in the early 2000s of stuff. Oh, we're putting all this money in for homeless projects. We're putting all this money in for here. Unfortunately, what I found, now that's just me being here in North Texas in my little corner of the world, that none of it found its way down to where the actual people. So in reality, the 20 years since all of the studies went, nothing had ever changed. And you know, an interesting side note on that, that you remember, you know, the term bag lady. Right. And I, yes. I'm sure we, you know, we use it in various things, but bag lady was actually for a homeless woman. Mm-hmm. And that started when the changes in the 80s, when President Reagan opened up the mental institutions and the things right. like that. And so, so many people are on the street, but some, the majority who were in these institutions were women. And I think if any listeners want to watch something that is just absolutely amazing. Lucille Ball starred in, it was a made-for-TV, actually, show called Stone Pillow. I don't even know when it came out, if any they are interested in that sort of thing. It's a beautiful... We'll we'll find a link to it. Hopefully, we can find it on the internet or Amazon and definitely provide a link back to it. You know, it's interesting. I I drive down the the street just north of where I live off Michigan Avenue and go down to the interstate, which is the the feeder onto the the Dan Ryan. And there is an area that if you if to get onto the Dan Ryan uh, freeway uh, safely, you, you basically get off and then get back on again. And there's this portion where you get off and get back on. It's like an entire tent city off the side of the road. Yeah. Oh, and it's just like, and it's just amazing? getting bigger and bigger. And there's a viaduct down uh, the next intersection south of me and going a little west. And 
underneath the, the train tracks, it's it's another tent city, and it's just and you just see it growing and growing and growing and not getting any better. And you know, from listening to what you're saying, things are not getting better. No, it's very much like back in the 20s and the 30s, and that some of the movies you watch from there, and it's it's identical to that part. But if we have a chance, and I know we're coming to the end of. It, it's my show. I get to do what I want. I get to do what I want. (laughs) Well, great, great. I I want to bounce back just a second to the round eyes book. Sure. And, and because since I wrote the first book, it came out and then realizing, well, okay, I need to change this up a little bit because I had run out of, it was out of print. I right. basically did it all myself. And so this time my roommate in Vietnam and at Walter Reed, where we were first stationed, she had lots of photos. So we decided, you know, okay, she shared them with me for the book. And which is really wonderful. So it gives life. It offers a little more visual. But this, this, my whole purpose, I think, was I see now when people come up to me at a book signing or they'll just see me out there and some young person will stop by and say, huh, Vietnam. And I said, yeah, you know, and they're, oh, you know, on. And I said, have you heard of it? You know, well, yeah, they mention it in history. They talk about World War II you know, a lot. We study that a lot. And he said, they kind of mention Korea and Vietnam and then move on. And I'm thinking in my mind, there, it's this history is being lost. Mm-hmm. Even though people, even in my time, there's this, uh, another book about Vietnam. Are you kidding? But there isn't anything because it's not being taught. And I think, to me, history needs to be made human. But my worst fear is not only is Korea lost, actually the Forgotten War, and then we have Vietnam, which is rapidly becoming non-existent. And there is a thing in here that I found on the web that I didn't want the American war in Vietnam to be limited by what history says about it. And I'm reading this. This is what I found from people visiting it now, visiting Vietnam. There's a few rusting tanks and revetments. Except for that, all traces of the losing side of that infamous war have been erased as if they'd never existed. Trees have taken back the jungle Bicycles have replaced tanks, jeeps, and other military vehicles on city streets. And this is from a man who, part of the stuff I took from him after he did a reconciliation visit in 2002. And he says over half the population of Vietnam is under 25. Most people I see and meet on this trip weren't born when the American War was going on. And so I I, I want the war and our future wars. I don't I'm afraid Afghanistan is going to be lost to history because it's taken us so long. I'm just, yeah. I just think that we're, we're losing sight of what has built our country to what it is. And I just don't want it forgotten. Most definitely. And the books like yours continue to, to keep the stories alive. And that story that you share and resonates. And even thinking back to World War II, I mean, your oldest veterans are nearing end are of dead. life. Yeah, and the and the the Holocaust. I mean, as somebody who was who was oh. raised to be to know about the Holocaust, about what it was, how bad it was, the repercussions. And when I hear stories today that people don't even believe the Holocaust existed, I mean, it, dare I say, people will never realize the Vietnam War existed unless individuals keep the stories alive through through the writings. And so, points well taken. Diane, as we come towards the close of our our podcast time today, I really want to thank you for the time you've taken out of your busy day and sharing your story, becoming a nurse, going to Vietnam, and coming back in your professional life uh, since then. And we definitely want to have our listeners share with our listeners uh, your your two books, the first, Round Eyes, an American Nurse in Vietnam, which was published first in 2012 and most recently again in 2019, because now it's illustrated. And Diane, would you share once more the the name of your ex-roommate that contributed some of the the pictures for this newest edition of the book? I would love to. Her name is Jenny Dornhagen. 
is her is her married name. In the book, you'll see Deerdorf, but she is Jenny Dornhagen. She does not have a website. She is a speaker, and she's very active in the Atlanta area, speaking with groups about Vietnam, some of the diseases, and some of the things going on. So she's active in that area, and she was so wonderful to allow me to share her pictures with my, my book. Fantastic. We'll do our best to work with you to put a link back in our show notes so folks can find Jenny if they would like. And also, we want to acknowledge your next, your second book, You Can't Sleep Here, which was the part fiction and factual story of your research work. And also, if our listeners would like to learn more about you, what is your website URL? And if you have any other social sites that you would like to direct our listeners to? Well, it is restlessauthor.com. And then my Facebook is facebook.com slash restlessauthor. Fantastic. Well, we will definitely provide backlinks to your Facebook page, Restless Author, and also to your website, restlessauthor.com. And we'll also provide uh, backlinks to your books on LinkedIn. And Diane, once again, I appreciate you contacting us. It was a pleasure to have you on the Success Insight podcast and for you to share your story with us. And hopefully in some 30 minutes of life, and we can uh, keep the story alive. As the individual you quoted from had kind of described as the wars, we, we can't let them be forgotten because the old adage goes, we have a habit of repeating ourselves. And unfortunately, <laughs> no matter what. No matter what. And, and so I would really thank you for helping to keep both of these stories alive, the homelessness issue we have, as well as the Vietnam War. So Diana, Thank you again. Thank you, just, Howard. I really appreciate it. Okay. There you have it, folks. We've just been chatting with Diane Klutz on a Success Insight podcast. She is a, she was a Army nurse in Vietnam and eventually a assist, retired assistant professor of nursing at Texas A&M. And she's the author of two books, Round Eyes, an American Nurse in Vietnam, which was just republished this year as a new illustrated edition. And she is also the author of You Can't Sleep Here, the factual slash fictional story based on her research of dissertation on the homeless community in the Texas area. So, I mean, at the end of the day, the message is these are important stories. Please share these and let us know your comments and what you think. Go out and check out the books as well as Diane's websites. And again, we'll provide the backlinks as well. So for our listeners, this is Howard Fox and the Success Insight Podcast. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there and have a phenomenal day. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.